uh, in English, written at the bottom of this photo in cursive, beautifully, it says, the first and only Syrian family in the United States, in the US. Um, who are the, <laughs> who are the Arbilis and um, why are they branding themselves <laughs> the first, <laughs> the first, um, the first Syrian family in the United States? Because they were, actually. They were telling the truth. So I just want to say that um, on the Moise Kharalov website is a, a story map, um, an in, uh, kind of um, interactive story on this family that, that I wrote. And the Moise Kharalov Center put it up and did all of the technical work. So that is the most complete group biography of this family that you can find right now. But this is one of those just incredible documents. This is the Arbili family. They were born, um, Yusuf Arbili and his wife, Mary Durrani, were born in um, out, just outside of Damascus. And they left in 1860 when all of that conflict was going on with the Druze. And they went to Beirut and spent 18 years in Beirut. Yusuf Arbili helped to what they call vocalize the Arabic Bible and vocalize means to add the vowels mm -hmm. into the, the Arabic script. And um, he was a teacher at the Orthodox um, Girls College. He ran an Orthodox school in a in a small town. He was one of the intellectual kind of Western affiliated elite. And his two two of his sons went to what was then called Syrian Protestant College which is now called American University of Beirut, um, both of whom got medical degrees from Syrian Protestant College. They belong to one of the um, elite Masonic lodges in Beirut as well, called Luliban Lodge. And they came to the United States after trying to go other places. They tried to go to Russia. They tried to go to a couple of other places and they ended up getting letters of recommendation and possibly a job um, in the United States. And so they traveled in 1878 to New York, stopping on, on their way at the um, World's Fair, the Exposition Universelle in Paris, and then coming to New York. And Yusuf, the father, got a job teaching Arabic at Merrillville College, which was a Presbyterian college in Merrillville, Tennessee. And if there's anyone uh, on this call from Merrillville or Knoxville, anywhere close to Merrillville, they're um, the gravestone of Mary Durrani, who died two years after they arrived, is in the Merrillville in the New Providence Cemetery in Merrillville, Tennessee. Um, three of the kids were born in Damascus, three born in Beirut. There, were act there was actually a, a daughter as well, but she died before they got on the ship um, to come to the United States. She's not in this picture because she had just died about a month before this photograph was taken. And they ended up in Maryville, Tennessee. So Yusuf taught Arabic. Abraham, the oldest um, boy who's in this picture if, um, on the upper left, standing, um, who was a doctor, set up a practice in Texas uh, where he went to find a better environment uh, to live in. They didn't really like Tennessee. They thought it was a little bit too small town. They didn't like the climate very much. There was not much employment to be had because it was a kind of poor Why state. Did Sorry to interrupt, but why did they leave New York to begin with? They had, um, Yusuf had a job in Maryville. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He had a job at the university or some. Yeah. And yeah. the Crawfords, who, who were founders of the college, um, had had a connection to some of the uh, Presbyterian missionaries in Beirut. And so they got, they read these letters of recommendations and hired Yusuf on the basis of these letters that Yusuf had gotten from the Presbyterian missionaries yeah. in Beirut. And so, and that's why they went. Yeah. But Go aside, ahead. Uh, yeah. Aside from them being the first, they're also unbelievably accomplished. So they start, they start, um, what I think is the first Arabic language newspaper, uh, in the United States. They're also highly, highly educated. Um, they're performers. They go all over, all over the place. They're doctors and lawyers and dentists and 
Um, so I guess my question to you as I sort of go through these slides um, and show some of these images, my question is, did the colony in New York um, revere the Arbilis? Did they have a relationship with the actual community in New York? Were they sort of celebrities among the community or is this just something that we think about retrospectively? Yeah, so every, I, um, I shouldn't say everyone, people did acknowledge that they were the first family to come, yes. Mm -hmm. But no, they weren't revered. Um, they were caught up in the sect, they were orthodox. They were caught up in the sectarian battles. Their newspaper, um, which was founded by the oldest son, Abraham, and the fourth son, Najib um, Arbili, and Najib ran the day-to-day -day operations because Abraham was a, um, a doctor and he lived mostly in Washington, D.C. And Najib started out, the newspaper started out as pe being kind of non-sectarian. It was the only Arabic newspaper in the New World. And so they talked about non-sectarian things. They talked about orthodoxy. They talked about the Maronite church. They talked about um, people having meetings and they didn't care who they talked about. They wanted people to know about the Syrian colony in New York. And you can see the first, for the first year, they even had an English language page, which I find kind of hilarious because I can't imagine who in the world would be reading an Arabic newspaper in English in New York City. I, I just find it hilarious. And clearly, nobody was interested in the English page and it, and it disappeared after about a year. Um, but once other newspapers started um, happening, which, which started in 1894, the first issue of Kaukab was in 1892. But in about 1894, there were other newspapers that started to be published and each had a sectarian slant. And so Kaukab became more and more orthodox and Najib especially became more and more um, strident in his orthodoxy and so he he was not a he was not a friend and to many of the people of the colony and the colonists many of the colonists especially the maronites didn't like him very much so there were these battles these internecine battles that went on that culminated in 1906 with the murder of a maronite man in the colony by what they thought were two orthodox men and there was huge huge trial that went on for months and months and months and it was a farce because no one spoke english the interpreters were not very good in english and they couldn't explain the concepts to the the judge or the lawyers the lawyers couldn't talk anything but english and the men were acquitted because there there was just too much uh, chaos and they never found who did it but it was kind of the boiling point of yeah. these menacing conflicts in the colony.